Hello and welcome to Dialogue, a true crime conversation. I'm your host, Rebecca Sebastian, and it is October, and you know what that means. That's right, it's spooky season. Here on this podcast and everywhere, hopefully. Uh, I know that means different things to different people and different podcasters. For me, it means I get to use that sound effect, which was super fun. And, uh, it, you know, a lot of people are leaning into the horror stories or the paranormal uh, cold cases, you know, spooky, eerie, mystery stories. But I want to take us into cults because I would say of all the sub subcategories of true crime, cults are probably the most fascinating to me. And if you'll remember my very second episode, so people who've been with me from the beginning, I interviewed Alex Ockeson, who is a cult survivor. And then I've had Josh Block, the journalist on twice, who covered two different uh, cults in two different podcasts. But we're doing something different. For this series, we're going to talk to four different people. We're going to have four different interviews. Two are experts, two are survivors. So the whole month of October will be about cults. And while, yes, there is a lot about cults that is dark and spooky, there's also a lot that's just misunderstood. And frankly, a lot of it is very normal. And that's why a lot of people join them. So you might actually find some of the stories relatable and some of the information mundane. And then some of it is just straight up spooky, dark, bizarre, twisted, manipulative, crazy, and interesting. And I love it all. And I am so grateful to all my guests for sharing their expertise and their stories. But before we get into today's guest, which will be the first one kicking off the cult series, I want to just do a couple of short announcements, if you'll allow me. Let's do the spooky music again. I love that. Okay, um, so first up, I will be live streaming every Thursday night. So if you listen to this episode the day it drops on Wednesday, on Thursday nights at 7 p.m. Eastern, I'll be on Get Vocal and I'll be talking about the previous episode and also just true crime headlines. Sometimes I play true crime trivia if people are up for it. So what Get Vocal is, is a free live stream app. You can play it, um, not play it, you can download it onto your phone. You can also do it on a web browser. And why I love it is because people can really interact. So if you if you watch the live stream through the app, you get to actually be in the audience and you can comment with other people watching. You can comment and talk to me. You can even pop into a little square and we can be in the same virtual room together and I'll see you and you'll see me. And that can happen for up to four people at a time. So it's really fun when people pop in and out. We can meet, we can interact. And um, as I said, I'll be there every Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern, and it also streams live at the same time to the Dialogue Facebook page and my YouTube page, which is my name, Rebecca Sebastian. I will link to all of those things in the show notes. So please join me tomorrow night and every Thursday night at 7 p.m. Eastern on Get Vocal. Okay, this part's not spooky, but I just can't stop. Next up, uh, the 2020 Discover Pods Award nominations are open. So this is basically a big contest every year, and there's a call for nominees. And it's your opportunity to vote for your favorite podcasts. And I would be humbled and honored and grateful if you nominated Dialogue. Uh, There's a lot of categories, so you can also put in a lot of your other favorite podcasts. I submitted my votes today, and yes, I did vote for myself a couple of times, but I also voted for my other favorite podcasts because I love what they do, and I want them to be recognized as well. And there's a lot of categories, so that's what's really cool too, is it really finds niches and different aspects of different podcasts, so they're going to have a broad range of winners. To help you along in your choices, here are the categories where Dialogue could be a good nomination. Uh, You could nominate Dialogue for Best Overall Show. I mean, hey, go big or go home, right? You could nominate Dialogue for a Best Individual Episode. So if you had an interview that you've listened to on Dialogue and you've loved it and it's been your favorite one so far, just put that specific episode number in the answer box. Uh, You could nominate me for the best podcast created and or hosted by a woman. Both are true. I created it. I host it. I'm a woman. That applies. Um, Best true crime podcast. I mean, look, there's a lot of amazing ones out there. I'm not saying it's your favorite, but if it is, you should let them know and you should vote for me. So 
Oh, and the last category, of course, best interview style podcast. Now there are other interview style podcasts, mostly outside the true crime genre, but I would just, I mean, this one makes my heart skip a beat, honestly. So if you only voted for me for one of those, I would love it to be for the interview one, but I am not trying to manage this democracy. You, your vote, your life, I'll never know, but I would really, man, it would mean a lot. So um, the link to that will be in the show notes. So check that out. It's the 2020 Discover Pods Awards. Okay, then that means it's time to introduce you to my premier guest in the cult series, and that is Rick Allen Ross. You may already know him because he's a leading voice and authority in the subject of cults. He's the founder and executive director of the nonprofit Cult Education Institute. Their website, which I will link to in the show notes, is a comprehensive database on cults. If you are wondering if an organization is a cult, you can just pop that on into their search bar, search it, and find out. If it is, it's in there, and all the information they have on it will be readily available to you. So it's an amazing resource, and uh, he's a deep programmer cult specialist. He works on family interventions, which we talk about. What does a cult intervention look like? If you have someone, a loved one in a cult, Rick Allen Ross is someone people call to help bring that person back out into their own independent thinking and then through recovery outside of the cult. We will talk about all of that and so much more. Uh, I reached out to Rick Allen Ross because I was reading his book, Cults Inside Out, The subtitle on that is How People Get In and Can Get Out. It is huge. It's a really thick book. I'm going to link to that in the show notes as well. Also, just a comprehensive tool for understanding cults. And he goes through the history of cults, the origins of them, and then throughout history, globally, all the cults, all the cults, many of which you have heard of. And it's the first published book to include Nexium as a cult. Okay, so it's recent, it's relevant, it's updated. And speaking of Nexium, we really do get into it. And um, I want to thank him for being on the show, but I want to give him extra gratitude because we had some major technical difficulties, first with internet and then with files. We ended up having to speak two times and our conversations went long. He was just such a great sport and so willing to share his his vast knowledge with me. So thank you, Rick, for all the time you gave to me. And because our conversation went so long, it's actually going to be in two parts. But that's kind of the, not bad news, but the, I don't know, that's the news. The good news is I'm not going to make you wait a week for part two. I'm going to release it tomorrow as a bonus. So first half of our conversation will be today released right now and then stay tuned make sure you're subscribed because tomorrow we will finish the conversation with rick allen ross and it is mostly about nexium just a heads up so without further ado here is part one of the cult series with rick allen ross and remember to check out him his book and his resources all in the show notes here we go let's kill the small talk Rick, thank you so much for being on Dialogue, a true crime conversation. Well, thank you, Rebecca, for having me on. It's my pleasure. I I have to say, I think, you know, true crime as a category and a genre has many subsections, right, and subcultures even, and cults have long fascinated me and might be my favorite subset of the true crime genre at large. So, You're the go-to guy to talk about this. I'm so excited to have you on, and I am making my way through your book, Cults Inside Out. It's it's dense. It's rich. (laughs) Yeah, there's a lot going on there. First of all, there's a, a, a recounting historically of modern cults, and then an explanation of of how cults really work and how people leave cults and ultimately move on with their lives. And of course, that's that's the intervention process that I detail in the book. And I've done about 500 interventions in the US and internationally to get people out of destructive cults. Wow, 500. Okay, so maybe we can talk about how you got here. Uh, you've been at this for a while now, but it was a very personal experience that even sort of introduced you to cults and destructive cults. Can you share a little bit about that? 
Well, now we're going back to the early 80s. In 1982, uh, my grandmother was in a Jewish nursing home in Phoenix, and that nursing home was infiltrated covertly, that is the paid staff, uh, by an extreme uh, religious group that targeted Jews and specifically wanted to target the elderly in the nursing home. Uh, they didn't come in the front door. They surreptitiously uh, got jobs there with the hidden agenda of recruitment. And um, my grandmother was harassed by one of them, told me about it. I realized what was going on in the nursing home, brought it to the attention of the director. And then the next thing I knew, I was uh, an anti-cult activist, a community organizer in Phoenix. And I work with uh, many people, committees, uh, different denominations, organizing uh, a kind of response to unethical uh, recruitment by certain extremist groups. Wow, so it was not intentionally a plan of yours vocationally to pursue this. This sort of happened because of your personal connection happening with your own grandmother that led you down this path to advocate for people in this situation. Yes, exactly. I, I think if, if that group had not infiltrated the nursing home, I doubt that it would have become something that I would have been involved in. But it kind of snowballed. I mean, in the 80s, uh, I started working as an activist, as I said, and, and working on committees uh, and so on. And then I was appointed to national committees in New York for the Union for Reform Judaism. And then uh, I took a staff position with Jewish Family Service in Phoenix and also the Bureau of Jewish Education. So I became the go-to guy for radical and extremist groups. And families would bring their loved ones to our offices at the social service agency and working often in tandem with a counselor or a clinical psychologist that we had on staff, we would do what um, we thought of as just listening. Uh, but what we eventually realized uh, because of the dialogue we had and, and the process was really a kind of intervention. And later I would learn that this type of intervention was called cult deprogramming. And by the end of the 80s, I was doing individual interventions for various families. And then I became a private consultant traveling uh, initially around the United States, doing these interventions everywhere in response to many different groups. And so I want to I want to lay some groundwork around cults. But while we're here at this intervention part for deprogramming, how willing do the cult participants need to be? So, you know, we've seen we're familiar kind of with the show intervention around drug use and we see varying levels of participation or willingness. What is it like in the case of cults? Well, it's different because in intervention, um, which I've seen, uh, you have someone who would who would more or less tacitly acknowledge that abusing alcohol and drugs is not a good thing. Right. And you and you wouldn't have a liquor store owner or a drug dealer knocking at the door saying, what are you doing? Uh, you can't take my customer away. So when you're dealing with cults, uh, that is the type of interference you have. The person may be texting, emailing, talking on their on, on, on their mobile with uh, a cult person, and that person is going to try to sabotage the intervention. So what, you, what we typically do, and I talk about this in the book, is just power down all electronic devices and agree to give it a, give it a break and not to have the people from the organization or cult uh, interfering or coaching the individual. And then that person usually, because of their family being there and actively involved, uh, they will most often agree to continue talking because they, they, they want to satisfy their family, that everything is okay. But unlike, unlike the person who's under the influence of alcohol or drugs, the person who's in the destructive cult sees it as positive, not negative, and doesn't recognize it as something that requires an intervention. But they cooperate out of a sense of obligation and commitment to their family, typically. 
Okay, and so how do you define success in an intervention like this? Well, an intervention usually goes on for about three or four consecutive days, eight hours a day. Uh, And then at the end, uh, the person will say, I am going to take a break from the group. I'm not going back to the group. Or they may say, I'm done with the group. In, In that event, I would say that is a successful intervention. A failure would be typically they leave in the first day or two. Uh, and they just break everything off and go back to the group. That would be a failure. Uh, my success rate historically has been around 70%. Wow. Wow, it's fascinating. And, and there's tactics involved. And is that strange considering most people probably fall under a, a cult's power due to the tactics they're using? Well, it's very different. What you're asking someone to do is think independently, right. uh, and you're you're asking them to consider uh, how influence techniques and coercive persuasion works, and is there perhaps a parallel between those identifiable techniques and 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 criteria uh, with the group that they're involved in. And then also you're looking at what defines a destructive cult, which quickly is uh, the presence of an absolute totalitarian leader that becomes an object of worship, who is the driving force and defining element of the group. Second, that the group uses coercive persuasion, thought reform techniques to engender dependency and gain undue influence over people involved. And then finally, that they do damage, that they're not benign, uh, that this is a group that exploits people, and that varies by degree from group to group. Some groups are much worse than others. But those three criteria, the absolute leader who's the defining element, the presence of a thought reform program to gain undue influence, and using that undue influence to hurt people, that would form the nucleus for a definition of a destructive cult. Got it. That's so helpful because, uh, you know, sometimes you read about cults and it, it's, it closely bumps up next to religious organizations, right? Uh, now, when you really use that checklist as the barometer, you can say, oh, okay, well, we're not doing damage. Maybe some people feel damaged by some religious upbringings, but it wouldn't be categorically defined as a cult. You know, Rebecca, many cults have nothing to do with spirituality or religion. Mm. Uh, they, it, it could be a seminar selling, a kind of self-help group. It could be martial arts. It could be um, an, a, an artistic kind of group, a political group, um, a, a therapy group. Uh, there are many different genres of cults. Uh, and that really is the outer trappings, the facade. What is behind the facade is the mechanics and structure that I just mentioned. And so it's not what the group believes, it's how the group behaves that's the issue. Mm, So belief versus behavior. Okay, so the exterior of these different styles of cults can look, sound, feel really differently, but the common thread of them is their function. What do you think is at the root of that in terms of cult leadership What's the common thread? What are they after? Uh, Self-aggrandizement, cash, sexual favors, power, control. Uh, The people that lead cults, uh, typically, uh, they lack uh, much of a moral conscience. Uh, They have often been described as sociopaths, narcissistic personalities, uh, even malignant narcissists and also uh, psychopaths. I mean, when you look at Jim Jones, Charlie Manson, you're looking at a psychopath, uh, someone who has virtually no empathy, no conscience. The only concern they have is what's good for me, which is what is good to them, and what is bad for them is what they consider bad. It's all transactional. It's all narcissistically, uh, obsessively focused on them. And uh, we're talking about uh, people that would not be examples of uh, mentally healthy individuals most often. Okay. So I wrote this to you pre-interview. I have this slightly out-of-the-box theory 
that comes from no research <laughs> other than my intuition and, and reading about various cults. But I see sometimes cult leaders that, I mean, what they do have on the positive, if you were going to make their list of positive and negative attributes, you just listed a lot of really severe damaging negative ones, but on the positive side, they can rally a crowd, right? They can galvanize people and get people behind a mission. Sometimes that's good. So sometimes there's something about them that's quite appealing. And I've noticed there's a creativity, there's an ability to identify problems in the world and bring solutions or what they think are solutions. So I wonder sometimes, and Charles Manson to me is the prime example of somebody who appears to me like a frustrated artist who had a little bit of success as an artist, but obviously things went so dark and so wrong with him. But do you think there is something innately good or a good desire that somehow turns? Or do you think this is kind of an intrinsic thing that they can't help? I, I guess I'm saying, do you think there's a lot of frustrated artists that are cult leaders? <laughs> Well, I, I think you've hit on a couple of things. First of all, many of the people that I've met that are cult leaders are very charismatic. Uh, they tend to be glib. Uh, they offer simple solutions. Uh, you know, and it's it can be quite appealing. Uh, sometimes they can be uh, very magnetic personalities and yeah. very well-spoken. I think David Koresh was an example. He was uh, in many ways, attractive, appealing. He was a very good speaker. Jim Jones was a great orator. And at one time, his church had thousands of uh, active members. It was one of the mega churches of the San Francisco Bay Area. Right. And, and uh, Charles Diedrich, who started Synanon, which was a drug rehabilitation program in California that became a cult, uh, and ultimately a criminal cult. And Diedrich uh, pled guilty to uh, crimes and the group eventually lost its tax exempt status and, 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 you know, just basically imploded, fell apart. But I think in the beginning, Diedrich, who, who practiced AA principles, you know, the 12 steps, and he was a reformed alcoholic, I think that he really wanted to help people. And he created a uh, what he thought would be an intentional community to assist people, help them to recover from uh, substance abuse. But, you know, power corrupts mm. and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So that that seeped into Diedrich and other people like him, cult leaders who had no checks and balances and who uh, became corrupted by the absolute power that they possessed. And the fact that everyone around them was uh, uh, yesing them. Uh, and you can see them as sycophants who were constantly saying things to feed into their uh, ego gratification. Uh, th virtually, they could never do anything wrong. Uh, they were always right. And in that bubble, with that kind of power, uh, people become corrupted by it and can become uh, just you know, much different than they started out. Right, right. Because even Jim Jones had some redeemable points to make early on about racial reconciliation. He was kind of considered progressive for his time in terms of the inclusion of African-Americans in his church. Uh, but certainly what you're describing seems to have happened to him too. And Synanon is new to me and I, I learned about it. And that's really interesting as well. Again, a model designed to help people out of a, a very common struggle turned so sideways and ending up, you know, wreaking so much damage. It's, it's really interesting. I guess, yeah, my theory is a little out there. I just, I wonder if there is something innately pure about it that goes sideways. And it sounds like maybe sometimes you're saying that does happen given these other things elevating their their position? Well, I think there are groups that I've encountered that have uh, very charismatic leaders that become an object of worship and are the focus of the group. And the group may have a certain mindset that is perpetuated by its training or instruction, indoctrination, but that it does no harm. And in that sense, it could be seen as a benign personality cult. Uh, you might categorize uh, 
Steve Jobs and Apple in that way. Oh my way. gosh! Yeah, you might, yeah. You, uh, an, another would be Soul Cycle. Another would be CrossFit, and my favorite example would be the architect Paulo Soleri, who created the community Arco Sante and taught a philosophy called Arcology. And he was worshipped in many ways by his acolytes, his devotees, but he didn't hurt people. And, nice. he, and he left behind a legacy, a foundation. And uh, I think many of the people feel very strongly that he was a positive influence. So I think there can be a personality cult that can be benign. Unfortunately, when I'm called in, it's not that way. It's some, some group that's quite destructive. Uh, though again, they're not all equally destructive. Some are much worse than others. So in your experience of these last few decades, I mean, can you point to what you would consider the most dangerous cult that people may or may not know about? Well, I think uh, faith healing groups that prohibit people from receiving medical care, there are, de there are deaths every year. So there are groups like the uh, General Assembly Church of the Firstborn, Followers of Christ, and others. Uh, for that matter, Jehovah's Witnesses don't allow blood transfusions. Yeah. And w women die needlessly because of, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the birth process, they may lose a lot of blood and then refuse a transfusion and then die. Children who need blood transfusions uh, have been ordered by the courts to receive them in, in contradiction to their Jehovah's Witness parents or their faith healing group parents. So I think faith healing groups uh, can be a real problem. And then, of course, we've seen the polygamist groups. Uh, there are 10,000 people that belong to uh, the Church of Jesus Christ, uh, uh, you know, uh, of the Latter-day Saints, mm -hmm. has a splinter group that's called the Fundamentalist Church of Latter-day Saints, the FLDS. And that group is in Arizona, uh, Utah, in Hilldale, Utah, and in uh, Colorado City, Arizona. Warren Jeffs, the leader, is now locked up in a Texas prison for raping children. And, and so there were all of these children, primarily young girls, uh, they could be 10, 11, 12, very young, that were literally being moved from place to place and assigned to different older men who would be their husbands. Uh, and Warren Jeffs uh, facilitated that. And this was a group that was very destructive. And then there were a number of other polygamist groups. There are probably about 50,000 at least polygamists living in North America and Canada and in various factions. And that, that has been a very destructive uh, kind of uh, examination that we've been going through of these groups where they, you know, leaders have been arrested uh, and there have been, there's been criminal activity. And then the white supremacist groups, uh, particularly those that are heavily armed, that stockpile weapons, that's of deep concern. And uh, groups, for that matter, that are black supremacist groups, like Israelites United in Christ and the so-called Black Hebrew movement, which at times can be violent. So I think there are a number of groups that are uh, much more destructive than, uh, by and large, other groups called cults that may just be interested in money, free labor. Uh, certainly leaders uh, often are involved in, in soliciting sex from members. So, so there, are, there are groups that are armed, there are groups that deny medical care that I think uh, are more of a concern than, than other groups that we might consider. Wow. Yeah, for sure. So these, these more sociopolitical groups you mentioned at the, the end of, of what you were just speaking about, how much does context and sort of time and place play a part in those groups? I mean, it feels like, I don't know, in 2020, things feel like we're moving to a more extreme place. And you, you called, you know, you said you would use the word cult around these factions of white supremacists or their black counterparts. Whereas I don't know, people would have maybe 
put that in the same category. So how much is context and politically and socially what's going on in the world? How does that play into cults or does it? What you look for in a destructive cult typically is a, a totalitarian leader who is controlling everything. Okay, so there's kind of fringy ideas and then there are groups more organized under a totalitarian leader. Where does Q Anon fall into this, which is pretty buzzy right now, but in all sincerity, is that a cult? I mean, this leader seems to be sort of figurative or abstract or I don't know if they're real or not, but is it an, an actual entity? What's your experience there? That is the key. The key is, does QAnon uh, actually exist? Is, yeah. there a, is there a single leader? Is it a collective? How does it really work? Um, it, it, is it really totally defined uh, by that leader and controlled by that leader? Or is it a movement that's taken on a life of its own online? And so what we're seeing more and more today is we're seeing groups that coalesce and 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 gather online. They don't meet each other personally. Right. Uh, there is a leader of many of these groups. Uh, for for example, uh, there there is a group called Love Has Won, led by uh, Amy Carlson, that is largely online, and people are getting downloads and they're listening to, uh, you know, to to what Amy has to say, she's considered Mother God, uh, channeling wisdom from uh, a higher power, and they uh, subordinate themselves to Amy and and follow her. But many of them are following her online. Or there's a woman Teal Swan, who has a very large following online. And many of these people have been called cult leaders. And what we're seeing, and this is an interesting phenomenon and QAnon is part of it, is the proliferation of groups online where they have a leader, they have a following, uh, people are interacting, uh, they may be uh, Skyping, they may be following someone on Twitter, on Facebook, they're watching endless YouTubes on YouTube channels maintained by these groups and leaders. And they're becoming indoctrinated, uh, becoming true believers, and even giving money through PayPal. And it's all happening online, and it is not happening face-to-face. -face. So, so what I see now is destructive cults that exist online where people can become involved and very deeply involved. In fact, I've done interventions to get people out of such groups in recent years. And, uh, and, and they never meet other members. They never meet the leader. Uh, the issue with QAnon is we just don't know who this leader is. Is it a single individual? Is it a collective? Who and what is uh, make, making the posts that are guiding the movement? Uh, and, and that is really, uh, for me, the, the tipping point as to whether or not QAnon is a destructive cult. Are, are, but I will say this, they're intensely uh, indoctrinating people. They have a kind of bubble echo chamber that they operate in. And people that are, are, are QAnon uh, supporters, uh, they just basically inhabit that bubble where they're constantly being reinforced by other QAnon supporters. And they go to their own selective uh, sites uh, and they follow each other in social media, and they reinforce each other. And when I dialogue with them or interface with them, which I do constantly because they troll various sites and will post things that are really just uh, uh, screaming rants uh, yeah. that are often quite hateful and nasty. And, and when, you, you, when you deal with them, you realize that in many ways they are cult-like because they have a very fixed mindset. And if you try to dispute anything that they believe and present facts, they dismiss the facts. And, uh, and they act in many ways like a, a, a cult member who is under undue influence and, and has no outside frame of reference and is not receptive to any perspective other than the group. 
Let's skip the foreplay. Murder. You want to talk about it. Hear about all kinds of nasty things. Sex. Torture. Madness. Dismemberment. And why, more than anything, you want to know why. Well, dear listener, you ain't never had a friend like me. Tune in to Murder Was the Case. Featuring author and investigative criminologist, Lee Meller. Sometimes solo, often with guests, always horrifically entertaining. Listen to Murder Was the Case on iTunes, Google Play, or go to murderwasthecase.podbean.com. It's gonna be sick. Okay, so in terms of Q, we've established that this is a pretty dangerous organization and there's a lot of misinformation flooding out from there. And given the political climate right now, is this something you're watching and are you concerned about what you're seeing from QAnon followers? I'm very concerned. I'm concerned about how it can lead to violence and how it has led to violence in the past. Uh, people driving vehicles into uh, protesters, uh, the the Pizzagate incident where where you know the 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 pizza business was attacked, and so I think that this is a this is a, a potential source of ignition to you know just blow up uh, in violence. Uh, there are many people out there that are that are actively online following QAnon, and some of those people may be uh, disturbed psychologically and emotionally, and QAnon could be essentially the match that lights a pool of, of, of gasoline on fire. And, and without QAnon, perhaps these people would not be so uh, likely to explode. And so I'm very, very concerned with how how this plays out, and also any politicians, uh, be they Republican or Democrat, who align themselves with these conspiracy theories in one way or another. I think they'll, they'll, they'll live to regret that politically, that it will have a negative effect on them. But in the short term, they may think it might help them in this election cycle, which I think is, is very poor judgment to look at it in the short term as opposed to the long term. Because I've seen uh, situations where destructive cults uh, have hurt politicians who have associated with them mm. in the long run. Right. So maybe their their vision, they can't see past the moment of how they can leverage it for opportunity, and it might come down to you know their detriment in the future. Are, do you think QAnon is filling uh, a need for not necessarily? It does seem like many involved have a propensity for for violence, um, and as you said, might be disturbed. But do you think it's also just? Do you think they're having such success because some people just aren't feeling heard, and they're uh, feeling like the mainstream media? That's a lot of their complaint, right? Is isn't giving voice to their concerns and their what they feel are losses, freedom, uh, different freedoms, freedom of speech, right to bear arms, things like that. So do you think, it seems to me like a lot of people might be vulnerable to the messaging who don't necessarily want violence, but are finding some uh, recognition in the messaging. Well, I think in, in general, destructive cults prey upon people that are going through a difficult period in their life. Uh, This could be a death in the family, uh, a divorce, they lose their job, they're doing bad in school, and they're lonely, they're depressed, and along comes some group, bad luck, that it's in the timing, and the group uh, interacts with them at a time of distress when they're vulnerable. And, and because they're vulnerable, they're more likely to accept the group and accept the solutions that the group seems to offer that might be appealing to them because the group is saying, we can take away your problems. We can make your life happy. And, and they don't take the time to investigate the group and look into the group thoroughly because they're anxious and in distress and they see it as a lifeline. 
So what we're dealing with right now globally is uh, very high anxiety over the pandemic, uh, disruptions in our in our in, in world economies, in commerce, in in people's lives, and people are very anxious about the future, and are very vulnerable in this sense. And so QAnon is feeding on that vulnerability and offering people answers that 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 really don't make any sense. But at a time of such high anxiety, people are looking for answers, anything to to stem off this feeling of chaos mm. that we're all dealing with. So do you think right now is sort of a ripe time for people to fall prey to be it QAnon or another cult because of these heightened anxieties and changes in our work and home life? Are, are people more susceptible right now than maybe they have been in the last five or 10 years? Oh, definitely. Absolutely. I mean, that is the appeal of conspiracy theories, Yeah, is that in a world of chaos, they provide a sense of order, that things can be controlled, that things are being controlled, and that it isn't just chaos. And the idea that you cannot control the world around you and that you are being subjected to something that 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 you you're just going to have to accept that that this is going to run its course and that you may not be able to control it that's a very a disquieting thought that's something that causes people to be very anxious uh what's coming next qAnon offers an alternative narrative they say we know what's coming next we know what's going on we can explain it to you yeah. and give order to the chaos and and so that's that's appealing to people. They're finding answers and they're finding these black and white responses and answers to things that truly probably don't have answers. And that's the appeal. Yeah, the, the QAnon offers clarity. They have an answer for everything. Uh, they have a conspiracy theory that addresses each and every concern or problem. But, you know, the, the, the information has been discredited over and over again. And we don't even know who Q is. Is Q a person? Is Q a collective? Who is Q? And uh, many, many people leave destructive cults because the leader has been discredited. They know who the leader is, and the leader does bad things like Keith Raniere or Jim Jones or, or David Koresh. In the case of Q, the people that follow Q don't even know what or who Q is. And I think one of the ways that we're going to deal with this phenomenon is that Q will be exposed and people will find out what exactly Q is. I, I certainly don't think it's, it's a source high in government with a, with a security clearance. I think it's, it's probably someone who once exposed or the, or the group of people exposed people will recognize that they have no credibility. And the reason that they're anonymous is because they have no credibility. Right. And how likely do you think it is that this will be revealed in time? Well, I think everyone is wondering and and investigating, and I think investigative journalists and people online will eventually expose who Q is. But uh, and, And that will be the beginning of the end of QAnon. Yeah. But I think what we all have to understand is that 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 the the nature of destructive cults has changed. Uh, it, it's no longer uh, a situation where cults are only recruiting on college campuses or having meetings uh, where people come to a meeting through uh, a, a member that introduces them to the group and then they they may be recruited. People are being recruited as we speak every day online 24-7. And social media and the online world has completely changed uh, the nature of destructive cult recruitment and how uh, these groups can exist. What we're seeing now are groups that begin and continue to multiply online. And they may never, the leader may never meet the followers, but they may get money 
from the followers mm-hmm. and support online through through services like PayPal. They may they may uh, followers may uh, go to their YouTube channel, their podcast, their streaming. Uh, they might talk to other people on a Google gaggle or Skype. So groups can be sustained completely online, and that's a new phenomenon that we all have to deal with. And that means that the reach of destructive cults is virtually unlimited. Anyone with an electronic device, be they a minor child or an adult, or or someone elderly in assisted care, can access a, a group online and be recruited and be indoctrinated while they're watching YouTube videos, listening to podcasts, streaming. And this is the new world of destructive cults. It's completely changed in that respect, and it makes their reach much more comprehensive and pervasive than ever before. Yeah, and insidious. Just It can be happening unbeknownst to you and to people you know without you knowing because maybe they didn't relocate somewhere and they're not attending meetings, so you're unaware. Um, well, yeah, they're online yeah. at home working from home, and you're <laughs> maybe at another place, and you have no idea they're being recruited. You right. have a child. That, that is being in, that is being recruited by a cult and communicating with a cult without your knowledge. And I have complaints like this on an almost daily basis wow. that this is what is going on now. And, and we need to be aware of it. And it's affecting our, our political process. It's affecting elections. It's, it's affecting uh, hate crimes. This is really... Uh, this is the way it will probably be for the foreseeable future. Uh, this is part. This is the negative part of social media. This is the the downside of the information age and the internet. And um, I I saw this beginning when I launched uh, the database culteducation.com in 1996, which is probably the largest database of, of its kind online. And I saw on being online being a very positive thing to educate people to inform people that they could find out all about a destructive cult uh, by going online and doing research that otherwise before before the advent of the internet was not possible but the same technology that provides that educational opportunity for people has a negative side and we're seeing that negative side yeah, I think you just tweeted an article. It might have been yesterday or even today, and it was USA Today, and it was about QAnon, and one of the words in it was infodemic, which was new to me. And I thought that term was really interesting that the pandemic has sort of – I mean, we've been seeing this with social media, what you're talking about over the last 10 years, evolve. You know, the good, the bad, and the ugly, the dark side certainly exists, but this this – moment we're in where misinformation spreads like a pandemic, I thought that that's so accurate, infodemic, um, yeah, really, and, really and, scary. And, and, let, and also let's, let's understand that people can cocoon themselves in social media and, and in the online world. Right. And even though they have unlimited access to information and that they can Google anything and find the facts, what people frequently are doing now, and we're seeing this over and over again, is that they only follow people that agree with them. They only go to sites that promote the conspiracy theories they wish to follow. And, and they can create an information bubble right. online that they inhabit, which is an echo chamber of constant reinforcement of these ideas, no matter how preposterous or ridiculous they are supported and reinforced by others within the bubble. And, and that's what we're seeing. We're seeing information control online in a world that you would think would be the antithesis of information control, mm. but rather access to all information. But people can be encouraged to cocoon themselves and, and, and only look to the media sources uh, the social social media sources, the the news sources, the websites that uh, promote a certain view, and that that is the only information they take in. 
Well, don't you think we're all a little bit guilty of that? I mean, that seems to be what's causing the division right now in politics and in current events in America is that we we tend to want to hear the news slanted one way in a way that we prefer, that we feel is more truthful or, you know, encompassing the whole narrative. So do you feel that way, that we're all doing that a little bit? We, we do tend to go to news outlets that we feel – um, are giving us the news in a way that um, that maybe we appreciate better be, be based on our political views. We don't have to. I right. mean, I frequently uh, will 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 make a point of going to multiple news outlets, and and I think people should yeah. go to multiple news outlets regardless of of their bias and see what those outlets are presenting. They. I find it's refreshing to see what what different different outlets are 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 reporting about a particular story because they're seeing it from various perspectives and and you get a more three dimensional view yeah. by 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 getting that kind of feedback. You don't have to agree with it, but it helps you to test your own ideas and also it challenges some of the other sources that you that you may be relying on. And I think people really need to um, scrutinize what sources they're relying on. And I'm not talking about the difference between CNN and Fox News. I'm talking about the difference between a major news outlet and an unreliable website or Mm. or YouTube channel that is spreading uh, preposterous conspiracy theories. Yeah. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I'll get an email and it's and they say, well, I know this is true. Here's the link, and then I click on that link, and I see the most ridiculous uh, YouTube video that supports uh, a, a ridiculous conspiracy theory. Yeah. So, so this is the difference between uh, reliable news through outlets like uh, you know Reuters, Associated Press, uh, USA Today, or whomever. Uh, and and uh, an obscure YouTube channel with somebody uh, broadcasting nonsense, and and but th- but this there is a growing uh, phenomenon of people relying only on that type of information, right? Which just circles back to their distrust of the media outlets, right? So of course it won't even get through to them that this is not a reliable source because they're like, of course we have to go outside what our country is looking to as reliable news sources. So it kind of just confirms their conceived notions already. It's, it's a a vicious cycle. Um, It's it's tempting to say they're crazy. You know, I'm talking about QAnon believers and to think it's, it's, and to dismiss it. But, you know, I think it's, they're tapping into a universal feeling. We all feel we would love to make sense of the world. I would love to see things in black and white. It just, Unfortunately, I feel like the more I know and the older I get, the more gray everything is. And there's mystery and there's things we can't explain and we can try and we can learn. So that's a universal feeling. So I have to tap into that sometimes to have some empathy and to not completely trash a, a population of people who are who are actually feeling something similar to me. They're just choosing to find answers and to seek out answers in a way that I haven't. Um, do you think that's well, important? And, and you have... And, and and you 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 have to realize that uh, that this really has to do with uh, people who already have a philosophy. This, this mm-hmm. is true in many cases. There are people that already have a philosophy. They're 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 racist. They they are intolerant. They have a perspective uh, that that they want to see substantiated. And so when, when when someone has that kind of confirmation bias and they already have a position, they already have an end product that they want, they want their their beliefs to be confirmed. Right. And so they, they, you can go online, and I don't care what your belief is, you can find confirmation somewhere online. Yep. And, and that's the world we live in. So you have people that... that that they already are predisposed and do believe in certain things, 
and they look for a group that will reinforce and confirm what they believe. And, and we also have this phenomenon of cognitive dissonance, yes. which is that people are told something by someone like QAnon, and then it turns out to be fake. It turns out to not happen as Q said it would. And rather than, than discredit QAnon and say, well, that's just proof that QAnon is an unreliable source, QAnon spins a, a rationalization, an apology, which is then reinforced by all the QAnon believers, and, and uh, anyone who disagrees is, is denigrated. And so that is the end of that, that process of considering or thinking that maybe QAnon might be wrong. Uh, you accept the spin, it's reinforced. And again, many of these people are living in a bubble online, and, and they're, they're only relying on certain sources online that will confirm QAnon in whatever way QAnon has spun their apology, their explanation for why things didn't happen the way they predicted. Right. Okay, I hate to end it there for you, but you're just going to have to wait one day for part two with Rick Allen Ross, and we are going to talk Nexium and mostly just Nexium. So part two on episode five with Rick Allen Ross on cults will be coming tomorrow. Thank you so much for tuning in. Make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss the episode and we'll see you tomorrow. Thanks for killing the small talk. Dialogue is a Yellow Tape Media production edited by Jason Usry and produced and hosted by me, Rebecca Sebastian. Please be sure to subscribe to Dialogue, a true crime conversation, wherever you listen to podcasts and follow us on social media. We are at Dialogue Pod across all platforms. You can also drop me a note or a guest suggestion or sign up for my newsletter at RebeccaSebastian.com. Be sure to join me every Wednesday for a new episode and another killer conversation.